Hello guys, David Vos here again. Well, today I um, want to do another video. Who to thunk, right? But I just got so much information, I've just got to put these out every day because I can't get all the information into one hour video. Not the way I want to. I can't, I mean, I don't want to do these videos to where it's just a bunch of information and and go look up all these texts and and study all this, you know, because I don't think we're going to get a lot out of that. What we need to know is under we need to understand why, and then add facts, because there are some facts. Some of the things that we might call facts have been distorted. So it's it's one thing you can go get a scholar and they can tell you, well, we have this manuscript and we have this proof and this date and this stone we found somewhere. And, archaeologically dug up and we're scholars and we're important and even that I don't believe or trust. So what I'm going to do is just tell you what I know as I always do kind of off the top of my head in story form. I want you to understand the background what's really going on because we don't have any authority as to what's really going on. We have the Bible. We have you know, that would be the only real authority. Because any book, even a history book, you know it's going to be written by somebody with an agenda. We know that Josephus was working for the the, the Romans. He was uh, Flavius Josephus. Well, Flavius, you know, is a title, basically, that the Roman Caesars would use. And so... He was an official historian for the Romans, so we're, we're looking at Josephus, and we don't know for certain. When we look at historians, a lot of times they were hired, and they were hired to write an agenda. But we do have a scripture, we have a Bible, and I'm, but right at the top, I want to tell you that I've done a lot of, you know, research, but I've, I've done a lot of praying more, more than anything else. And I've sat, and I've prayed, and I've, I've spent time listening as well as praying. And the Lord has revealed many things to me. And, you know, after I, I, I see in my mind's eye what the Lord is revealing through His Holy Spirit, I don't stop there. I don't think, okay, I'm going to go tell everybody what, what I know without any proof. Well, I'll go and I'll look it up. See, well, no, this is crazy. You know, I have this, knowing within me that this is true but i gotta go and i've got to take a look and see if there's any actual actual corroboration in the facts of history can we find proof for for these things is there is there are there things in the world that we can determine factually now you might say well we find an archaeological dig and we dig up some scrolls that might be proof but again just like the historians were hired for an agenda, many times archaeologists are hired by governments and there's an agenda as well. So what are we going to do? Well, let me tell you the story that will go further than the narrative that they're giving you. In other words, the facts that they're giving you. I'm going to go before that. I'm going to show you that they made up these facts. I'm going to show you how they did it how they invented Hebrew, how they invented the Hebrew manuscripts that the Masoretic scribes supposedly used, which was in about 1000 AD. I'm not only going to show you and prove to you that their facts were manipulated, but that the entire Hebrew language was, was made up in the first, well, between the first and the eighth century. And I'll show you how they made it up. It's a completely fabricated language. Hebrew didn't exist. There's no such thing. The original Bible is the same Bible written in the stars and the hieroglyphs and in the Sumerian tablets. It's, it's the story of Inki and Enlil. It's the story of creation. Yah. It's, you know, these stories have been, much of the writings and the Psalms and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and so forth written by Solomon was written in Egypt. Solomon's temple was in Luxor, Egypt. And we have found manuscripts in Egypt that are far older than the scriptures that we have. That it's almost word for word what's come what we have in the in the writings. 
So these are ancient texts. Just like in the New Testament, you've got Paul quoting the Old Testament texts. Well, Solomon was one of these wise men and he was quoting these wise sayings that had been handed down. It wasn't just, he didn't just invent them. See, these are, these are truths from way back. I mean, Jesus said, love thy neighbor, that he didn't invent that. Well, maybe he did in another life, but it goes back to ancient Egypt. So, they claim that in 1947, out of nowhere, voila, some people decided that they took over the land of Palestine, we'll call it, because I don't want to, you know, trigger any flags. So I'm, I'm using words that are, you know, kind of benign. They don't mind that word. But that Middle Eastern area that we know of there, sometimes called Palestine, if you know what I mean, south of Syria and Lebanon. Well, some, all of a sudden, it's now called the State of Israel in 1948. It was recognized by the United Nations. And, of course, in 1947, they had a war and they declared it themselves as their place. So around 1947, but there's other dates. You go back to 1917, the Belfar Declaration. People were going in there and living there from from 1917. And even prior to that, there were people that were trying to go back there. Because we, we, we can fairly, we can make fairly good, accurate assumptions that, that that area was the area where Jesus stood when he looked at that temple and said, not one stone will be left upon a stone which was Herod's temple. So Herod built this wall. That's what his temple was. So this, and, and, and of course, when Jesus was there in 70, or before 70, you know, he said that it, not one stone would be left. And of course, by 70, it was destroyed. And there wasn't one stone left upon another stone. So that wailing wall that you see down there, it's not even part of, neither is it, it's not, let alone Solomon's temple, it's not even Herod's temple. It's some, buildings that were that were built and i said the other day that perhaps by muslims but now i believe that it was built by the freemasons remember they went in the crusades to that particular area freemasonry or templar knights and soldiers with the cross crusade in about the 1000 to 1100 they had gone in there and there was wars in the 1100s and they took it and made a kingdom of David. They called it the kingdom of David. And we're going to, we're going to show you that they did some shenanigans to try and prove that they were the rightful heirs. Now, we don't even know if they were Judeans, right? We don't even know who these were. They were Knights Templars, but they wanted to prove and maybe they had lineage reasons and stuff. We've, we've talked about genealogies and stuff. So we're not going to get into too much of that here. But whoever these Freemasons were from Bavaria, yeah, that's where they were, Goths, they they had, at, at this time, had already invented Christianity. Christianity was the pagan mysteries that was destroyed in 395. The flame went out, the Vestal Virgins was discontinued, the uh, Rex Sacrorum was discontinued, they continued with the Pontifus Maximus, but they didn't have the higher kingship. But they had for 300 years been chipping away at the mysteries and calling them pagan and evil, which nowadays we think that's an evil word. It just means the non-Judean, pagan, non-Judean, Gentile, heathen, meaning the nations. And they had been chipping away with at, at all of this uh, Christianity that is the true Christians, which was the Essenes that we said that was up in Syria at the Temple of Artemis and these mysteries. You know, the Apostle Paul talked about knowing the mysteries. Well, and he got, you know, on the road to Damascus, he was initiated into the mysteries and heard the words that was unspeakable or unlawful for a man to speak. And so they had been arguing about how all of that was pagan and all, we, you know, we have to go back to the Bible. 
which they had convinced everybody was the Old Testament, and go back to the Old Testament deity who says, I am deity and there is none else, and you'll get down and worship me. So they had come pretty much convinced everybody then. They started demanding that everybody understand that the Father was this Jewish deity. And we had to continue to keep, keep laws and work our way to heaven. And if we didn't do it, we could, you know, we had to repent and, and, and go through, uh, some inquiry, or the Inquisition. We had to recant. And if not, we were anathema and they would hang us on crosses and, and behead us and everything like this and demand and force people into this belief system. So they eradicated the mysteries. They got put out the flame. Women were now relegated to under, like the law says, had to have a veil and couldn't speak and, and were property. They, they went back to the Old Testament, which was genocide, wars, colonization of the world, uh, slavery, and buying and selling women. I know you thought it was marriage. But this is the world when, by the year 400, when the Goths took over Rome in 405, by that time, you could say it was finished. There was absolutely no chance of going back to the true mysteries. In 395, they put out the flame, which is the original flame that they had to keep perpetually burning by the Vestal Virgins who came from the line of Zara, like Caesar, right? The, the Zara, the, the royal bloodline back to Judah that came up and went to Troy and they, they had a child named Annius and he had, you know, Romulus and this is where Rome, the royal bloodlines of Rome was from Judah. So they had these ancient truths. This is also where um, Eliu went to the area around Baal back up in Syria and had this confrontation with Baal worshippers. And then they, you know, threw that false worship out and they started their worshipping at the temple of Dionysius, which in Hebrew, or now let's, you know, we, we, it's habit to say Hebrew because it wasn't really Hebrew. But that word is really a Phoenician Canaanite script. It was where they worshipped El. They didn't say Dia, which is like the Greek. Dia, Dion, Isus. Isus is the Savior. Dionysius would be like Dia or the Lord is Savior or the deity is Savior. But in this other Phoenician script, it would be Elsius or Elisha. So Elisha was this person that went up there and carried on with two parts of the power of Eliu up at Mount Carmel, up by Zarephath, or the line of Zerah, and the widow's son, or Zarephath's son, who is the lineal priesthood, was raised up by Eli Elysius. And this was the Elysinian mysteries. So this is what the Vestal Virgins were. They had, Dionysus had all these Vestal Virgins, and it was these original teachings and these mysteries, and they had the sacrament and the body and blood of the Lord, which was higher priesthood of Melchizedek, that he brought out bread and wine, which we found out is not grape juice the other day, but is a sacrament that when partaken of, one is brought because of this herb into a higher consciousness and they see the divine being truly and they're filled with the Holy Spirit, higher consciousness. But these were sacred and you couldn't just go in there and, you know, and learn all of this without uh, being a part of the group and being initiated, and you had cer certain, uh, you know, classes to go through, and if you didn't make it through the class, if you failed, or if you if you didn't have the right heart, they didn't allow you to have this. That's why Peter told Simon Magus, your heart is wrong. You know, you can't, we're not going to tell you this these wonderful truths. We're not going to initiate you because your heart is full of vile. And you thought that through money you could receive the power of the Holy Spirit, which is given to those freely who earnestly seek it. So, we were talking about the Dead Sea Scrolls the other day and saying that we had just about decided and proved conclusively that the Dead Sea Scrolls were fake. 
We know that some of the Dead Sea Scrolls have been proven beyond a doubt, even in the world today on, on YouTube, you can read about this or hear about it, and books and so forth. And everybody's saying there's certain ones of these Dead Sea Scrolls that we, they've proven now that are fake. Well, I'm going to show you today that the entire Dead Sea Scroll collection, entire the entire thing is fake to some degree. Now, there, there are some, like the Damascus document we keep talking about, which proves that there was a Damascus sort of headquarters to the Essenes. They had the Damascus Scroll and the, the, the Manual of Discipline. These were actually not even part of the Dead Sea Scrolls. We've been lied to. They were found down in Egypt. So they may actually be real. So there's a lot of stuff going on here that we've got to dissect. But basically, most of these Dead Sea Scrolls that they claimed to have found in 1947, which is the very year that they started moving on this new land, and they wanted to prove that they were the rightful owners. Well, this kind of proving and manipulation we're going to show goes all the way back to the Crusades with the Knights Templar and all the way back to when this language they now call Hebrew was invented the first, second, and third centuries and perfected by the 8th century and then written down in a fake priesthood called the Masoretic Scribes in 1000, which these people claiming to be Hebrews were Masons, Templars, and this was the 10th and 11th centuries in the Crusades. And this is why they did it, because they wanted to prove they were the rightful owners of this land. In the Crusades, they were trying to take over Palestine from the Muslims. So they did some shenanigans to try and prove that. Well, they just reused the same information. They had, re they had written from the Septuagint, which was the only Bible that ever really existed, authorized and, and, and translated by the Sanhedrin. 250 B.C. by the priests, by authority, by the divine will of the Sanhedrin. Authorized, right? Talk about the authorized version. Well, this was the authorized version, the Septuagint, written in Greek. And it was later called the Textus Receptus, the Holy Textus Receptus. All the Greek, by the New Testament and the Old was all written in Greek. There's never been not once ever, ever, ever found a Hebrew manuscript. They have said that they found a, uh, one or something. They, de they deceive people. They, they use big words and you, you think that, because you don't have time to go and study all this information. So we think, oh yeah, well they've, they've got old Hebrew manuscripts and fragments and stuff that date back, way back, and we know that it's real and there was Hebrew manuscripts. That's a lie. Up until the Dead Sea Scrolls, there's never been found one Hebrew manuscript. All the ancient, like you heard about the Vaticanists and the the Alexandria Scroll and the, oh, Sinaiticus, yeah. There's several of these ancient, the oldest manuscripts of the Bible, including the Old Testament, they tell you. Oh, it must be Hebrew, right? You think that. But it's not. These, these, these scrolls that, that the Bible was, trans, the King James was translated from, the Vaticanus and the Sinaiticus and so forth, were Greek. And this is why they tell you that the that the new that the, the King James Bible was actually translated from the text Holy Textus Receptus only because the LXX the Vaticanus was Greek. So they're like, oh, it's the it, it must be the same Greek as the no, it was just a copy of the Septuagint that the Vatican had. All right, an actual manuscript dating from that. We don't have any older manuscripts. That's the oldest one. But it's not the Septuagint. It's something, a translation of it, right? In some particular manuscript. And it's all Greek. There's never been any Hebrew. But in 1000, these Masoretic scribes that were not scribes, they were priests, uh, you know, because they still knew that when the Judeans went into captivity, they had Aaronic priests. And they knew because their names were usually Cohen or Levi or whatever. So they knew they were from the Levites. And, and they had, for years, in these families, you know, genealogically, they can trace their, their families back to these priests. But they had no authority to be priests anymore. That authority went away with the temple. They don't have the Ark of the Covenant. They don't have the Sanhedrin. So they're just people lost, right? Of, you know, refugees from the, from the ancient Judeans claiming they're priests now. Well, they, they never were. It's a big hoax that they were sitting in the room going, oh, I'm carefully transcribed. It's all a big hoax. I'm going to show you. 
So the manuscript that they claim to have, I told you that they just made up out of thin air. Well, here's what actually happened. They had this, what they, we don't have any complete manuscript until about the year 1000. We had one called the Aleppo and the Leningrad. There were these two Hebrew manuscripts. They just came out of thin air. Well, somehow or another, the Aleppo manuscript just disappeared. Now we don't have it. So all we've got is the Leningrad complete translation of the Hebrew scriptures that just appeared in 1000 AD. It's not like somebody went and dated it and said, oh yeah, this manuscript is uh, 1000 AD or something like that, or it was 500 AD. Or, they don't know what the date was. We just know it was 1000 because they produced it then. They didn't claim to date it. It was just a copy. But what were these Masoretic scribes copying in 1000? What was this? They wrote this entire Bible in Hebrew. Right? They say, well, they copied it from other manuscripts. We don't have those other manuscripts. But we do have them. We do know where they got them. You see, in about the first century, when Judea, you know, in 78, 70 CE, it was destroyed. When this temple of Jerusalem was destroyed. There were some of these Pharisees that went up to Syria. And they had this Talmud written in some sort of weird block letters. It wasn't Hebrew. There was no Hebrew language. Okay, before Christ's time, the people in that land of Canaan spoke Canaanite or some sort of Phoenician kind of a, a script, an ancient script that wasn't block letters, it wasn't Hebrew that we have today. Okay, there's no proof that there ever was such a language called Hebrew. Okay, we have pictographs and we have uh, cuneiform and we have some sort of what you would say is Phoenician. They were the first ones to put it in these little letters. But they weren't block letters like we have. They were like little pictograph letters. Okay, and they were not, it wasn't called Hebrew. And we've never found any Hebrew Bible with that written in it. Now, these Dead Sea Scrolls are supposedly written in modern block letter Hebrew. All right? If they were from before Christ, that would be impossible. Because I will show you, and, and they will admit that the block letter Hebrew that is spoken today or written today is not very old. It doesn't go before Christ. It was actually, and I'll show you where this block Hebrew, we'll, we'll talk and discuss and give evidence and prove right here, right now, that's what we're about to do, that this block letter Hebrew thing that we call Hebrew, it's the only language we ever called Hebrew, with these little block letters, started being created from some other block letters, we don't know what they were, that the Pharisees were using, that they probably got from Babylon. But it wasn't Hebrew. They didn't call it Hebrew. But they had written their Talmud in it. And so, these, their priests, which aren't authorized by the Lord, but they called them their priests. They were in the tradition of priests anyway. So, they would painstakingly copy this book called the Talmud. And they took the Septuagint and recreated another Bible written in this block letters. Well, it wasn't Hebrew at that point in the first century. This block script that they're claiming is Hebrew was at that time, before it even existed, this block letter, it was Aramean or up around this area where these Judeans who were transcribing their Jerusalem Talmud. There was the Babylonian Talmud and the Jerusalem Talmud. So, the Jerusalem Talmud was the Pharisees that basically, after the fall of Jerusalem, they took over Judaism and they wrote their Talmud and they went up by Petra and they was using these already existing block letters, Armenian, that's kind of like Aramaic, but this is what we have is Hebrew. They invented it from the block letters of the Armenian Syrian language that was already there and they developed it slightly different by the year 300 they were writing uh they were, they had finished their Talmud and so they were they were translating the Talmud and they used this block letters to rewrite the entire Old Testament after their own image taking out the virgin birth and so forth there at Petra and then later at Palmyra in Syria. 
we know that this Hebrew block script was only after Christ. They never had it before Christ. And that is the Hebrew language. So they were up at this place at Petra. They had some monuments up there and they lived there for a while. This area was called the Nabataeans. This then is where these Pharisees that escaped the fall of Jerusalem went to and they started writing their Talmud in this block script, but it wasn't Hebrew. Well, because they were supposedly Jewish scribes, when they went from there to Palmyra, about two or 300 AD, we find that they're still writing their Torah and their Talmud in this, now they've developed this block script into full-fledged, they call it Hebrew block script. This is the, this is how Hebrew came into being. You couldn't call any language before Christ that wasn't written in this particular block script that they invented from some block script that wasn't Hebrew. Kind of a Armenian, Aramaic kind of block script. It had, there was no evidence, no one ever said that that originally in the first century that Americ, that, that block script was Hebrew. No evidence. But by the time we get to Palmyra and these Jewish scribes, you know, transcribing the Talmud there and their Torah, at that point, they were calling it Hebrew. They didn't claim that it was an ancient language. They claimed they just invented it. So here they were with this new language called Hebrew. Remember that Charlemagne, once they had wiped out all the seed of Mary Magdalene and Jesus down there in the Languedoc and southern France. They had no more royal bloodline from Judea to rule over them. And every nation has to have a royal bloodline. So Charlemagne went down to Baghdad because it was no longer Babylon that had been destroyed. But there was another city in that same area and they was calling it Baghdad, which we have a Baghdad today. So they went down there and there was a seed of Judah from Jeconiah that they brought up to the German area, the Holy Roman Empire. And they had him marry Charlemagne's aunt. And this started the lineage of the Franks and the Dagoberts and, and this particular European bloodline that came to Vlad the Impaler and goes all the way down to King Charles now. But it was mixed in with the Rothschilds at one point, And I don't know if we're going to have time to get into all of that. But that's not what we're interested in today. What we're trying to say is that there was a group of individuals that was running the Holy Roman Empire that were no longer the original people. They were now Goths who had come down from the north that defeated the kingdom of Septimania or the children of Mary Magdalene, dispersed them. They went to Britain and we talked about all of that yesterday. So they were, that was the big inquisition, the Valdensian, Albigensian, the Spanish Inquisition, they drove them all away. Because when they, when they rooted them out with the Waldensian Inquisition, they moved to Spain. Some of them went to the Ottoman Empire, which is why they had World War II, to take it back from them. But many of them went up into the Ukraine area too. And there was a big, Stalin went in there and wiped out a bunch of them. Some of them went to Poland. Okay. And so Ein Fuhrer went and got rid of a lot of them. But this is many, many centuries later. They were just mopping up. But originally, the Inquisition was to wipe out the seed, and they kept driving them out. So they went to Spain, and then they had the Spanish Inquisition. And then from there, they all went to America. And they started the Kingdom of America. Well, right hot on their heels was these Red Cross, you know, skull and bones ships from the Freemasons that came over and subverted America and the Constitution. But going back, Charlemagne then created this lineage from Judah and installed this line from King David through Jeconiah on the throne of the Holy Roman Empire that was now ruled over by the Goths. So essentially then, this, these were people that wanted to prove that they had the right to rule. They had to go down and find somebody from the line of Judah. By the way, if they were in Baghdad, that means they were not a line that went to, 
that went back out of captivity. They were still in Babylon. So they weren't out of captivity. They weren't of the line that became, that went down to Christ. Because Christ obviously wasn't born in Babylon. But he was born in Galilee or up around uh, Bethlehem, I should say. So that was on the border of Ephraim and Judah. Bethlehem of Ephratah or sometimes Bethlehem of Judea. And that's where all the kings were born because they were of the lineage of Joseph and they were also of the lineage of Judah because Judah performed a Leverite marriage to raise up seed for Joseph. We've talked about that in other videos. But these are where the line of the kings came from. King David, who was of Jesse the Ephraimite, who was Ephraim, the son of Joseph. So, Charlemagne then had indeed someone of royal blood. Now, remember, these individuals from the royal bloodline of David went everywhere. I mean, when Solomon had a thousand wives and the Talmud, or I should say the Midrash, confirms that Nebuchadnezzar was also a royal bloodline from King David or through Solomon and Bathsheba. So, these Royal bloodlines went into all the world and in every nation. They had a, a line of Judah in every nation because they came and married. Every one of their daughters and women would come and marry Solomon and they would have a child or an heir that would go back and rule over that nation. That was how Solomon conquered the entire world, marrying all these wives. But instead of conquering them, they conquered him. And they degraded the ancient truth into this outer carnal Babylonian law and they built the outer wall of glory, right? The, the physical, the strong, material, carnal, brute, bestial kingdom with laws. And so this is why they brought all this gold to Solomon and every year he got 666 talents, 666, right? Because it's the outer carnal, it's the evil or the love of money, which is the root of all evil, and the laws that promote it, the slavery, the Torah. So these individuals then were not the line that went to Christ and then to southern France and started the Knights, Lazarus, the first night. And by the way, why is it, like we were talking about the other day, how Joshua says that when they knighted him, really it was the transfer of the Holy Spirit. Well, yeah, the symbolism tells you very clearly that a knight had to pull out the sword from the rock. The rock, the stable truth. The sword is the spirit of the, of the word. Well, the Bible tells us that the sword is the sword of the spirit. And it also tells us the word of God. So anyone who was of the line of Mary Magdalene, they're knights. They weren't warriors. They were protecting the Holy Grail. And they had, in order to become knighted, they had to pull out the sword of truth the sword of the spirit. They had to be able to handle it well and put on their armor, right? The helmet of salvation and the girdle of truth and uh, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith and so forth. The word knight literally means like a horse or a person mounted on a horse. So it's all about the battle, but it was a spiritual battle. It's the Lord and his armies coming on their white horses and they were protecting the Holy Grail. They, this was, they knew that this was a spiritual battle. They didn't go and wipe out genocide and war. And so when the Romans came down, or the, I should say the Goths that controlled the Roman Empire with Charlemagne and, and, and had this Inquisition with the Waldensian Inquisition, they didn't stand there and try to fight. Peter Waldo gave up all of his wealth to the people and became a beggar. He had nothing, just like Eliu, who went out and went into the wilderness, survived on a little bit of bread with this widow. They were humble. They lived in the mountains. And then they, when they came after the people of the valley, the Waldensians, the Valians, they went to the mountains or the Alps and they became the Albigenses because they were hiding. And then when they drove them out of the Alps, they went north up through Paris and up to north, northeastern France and then to the British Isles of Scotland and, and places. And, and finally, they, they even drove them out of there and they went to America as pilgrims. 
They didn't want to fight. They're not fighters, they're lovers. And they had the truth and they would always, wherever they would go, translate the Bible into the, into the common language. But these Goths that had this lineage from Babylon now on their throne, who were now being controlled by Satan himself, because remember the children, children of Dan went up to Mount Hermon where the, where the, the giants came down and made their pact. And when they all died, they became the spirits or the demons or the Rephaim. And when this group, you can read about it with John D. and Edward Kelly in Bavaria, opened up the bottomless pit and channeled Satan. And he told them to have orgies and he told them to create this modern languages. I believe they created the angel language is what they called it, which is English at that time. But Satan had been doing this all the way back, remember when he confused their languages at the Tower of Babel? Well, he'd been doing this. And so this entire this Hebrew language was created by these Talmudic priests that, that had written this in this block script, whatever it was, that they later called Hebrew. They wrote and completely invented this language and they were copying their Talmud and their Torah. So it was obviously the devil's plan to get a royal bloodline ruling the world at the Vatican. See, they're, they're trying to prove their authority, saying, oh, we've got a king from the royal house. We can rule. Oh, we're going to take over this area. Well, yeah, you see, we're the authority. This is our land. And to prove it, the Holy Bible, which is the, the word of the divine being, the truth that you got to follow to control everybody, you see, it's written in a secret language that only we know. We're the arbitrators of law. So they went down there and got some of this, these, this Talmud people. They said, come on up here and translate the entire Greek Bible that's written in Greek by the authority of the Sanhedrin. Change it into the secret language that only we're, we know how to speak. This dead language. We're, we're going to pretend this is Hebrew. We'll say this is the, the sacred language. Well, they invented it so they could have a monopoly on truth and control everybody. So there's nothing before Christ. They invented it in the first century and perfected it by the 8th century. And we find then by the 8th century, we find this block Hebrew quite prominently everywhere and, and these different scrolls. And by 1000, they had taken, the, with the Crusades, these Freemasons, these Goths, they went down and in and, and, and military Crusades, they... They, in Inquisitions, they killed them. But when they went down there, they knew that it was a spiritual battle as well. So they had to infiltrate their teachings. And they got these mysteries from them and brought it back and took it into their little group and studied it and were like, wow, this is really great. But they never really understood it. So they turned it upside down and backwards and created the Illuminati from these ancient knights and the Knights Templars. So they 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 murdered all of the Templars in Paris and then they had another group called the Rosicrucians that started up, which was started by uh, Francis Bacon, who his stage name was Shakespeare. And he was the brother of King James and they wrote this King James Bible in 1611 because just before that, John Dee and Edward Kelly had brought up Satan from the bottom of the pit and he told him how he's going to take over the world by creating confusion, lies and false science, false beliefs and turning everybody back to the god of war. So this is who the crusaders were. They conquered the land of Palestine then, but then the Muslims drove them out. But before the Muslims dro drove them out, these Jewish scribes had transcribed the entire Bible, which was all written in Greek. There was no Hebrew, but they translated it as they did their Talmud in this block script that they now called Hebrew on vermilion sheepskin. Which, if it was, if the Dead Sea Scrolls were really from be the time before Christ, they would never be written on vermilion sheepskin. They wrote on vermilion sheepskin in around the year 1000, the Crusaders. This is when you find all these documents written on the sheepskin. But back before Christ, they wrote on parchment. They never wrote on vermilion sheepskin. And they never wrote with block Hebrew letters. And everybody knows that if you're going to find an old script and it's block Hebrew, that it's not before Christ, because before Christ it didn't exist. It really didn't exist before the third century at all. 
It was developing at that time. They started developing it in the first century from this other block script. But before the first century, there was no block script of any kind that remotely resembled Hebrew. But here we find the Dead Sea Scrolls that we claim, that they claim is two, 300 BC, some of it, all the way back to maybe 300 BC to 100 BC, or even the time of Christ. But most of it before Christ, they're saying, that was written, number one, in some sort of Hebrew block script that didn't exist at that time. Nobody's ever, like, you know, ever even question that because people don't know what to question because they're not told the truth. They're just told lies. So they don't know this stuff. And it's written on vermilion sheepskin, which they didn't write on vermilion sheepskin before Christ. Only parchment. So we know beyond a shadow of a doubt it was all forgeries. And, well, we also know beyond a shadow of a doubt that they lied about it because anyone who was actually a scholar would know that if it's written in this block Hebrew script on vermilion sheepskin that it is not real. It is a forgery. They know that beyond a doubt. They lied. Now, conveniently in 1947 when these Bavarians had commandeered this land like they did in the 10th and 11th centuries with the Crusades. And they invent this thing that they call Hebrew and convince the entire world that it must be, since they found the Bible actually written in Hebrew, it must be then that they were the rightful heirs because they were the only ones that spoke this language and it was a secret thing and it was a secret name of deity and only they knew it and their priests were great. But remember, these weren't even priests. They had no authority by any Sanhedrin or any divine priesthood that was backed by you know, any power or miracles or the divine being. Uh, the divine being had scattered them and destroyed them. They had no favor. The Lord Jesus said, I dismiss you. Your house is left unto you desolate. So they had no Holy Spirit. They had no Sanhedrin. They had no authority. But they wanted to prove they had authority by saying, look, we've got this special language that only we know. We invented it, but we're going to tell you that even though you guys know that this le these, these letters and this Hebrew that we're writing, we haven't found any one manuscript ever with this language before Christ. It, they, all the scholars will tell you it doesn't exist. Only in some kind of Phoenician Canaanite script have we ever found any inscriptions or in, 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 in Palestine before Christ. It's all in some sort of Phoenician script. Some people might say, well, it looks like it might have been Hebrew. But it wasn't. It was the same Canaanite, you know, Phoenician type letters, not block letter Hebrew that we have today. So we never had any, any, any inkling that there was, the Bible was ever written in Hebrew. And all these manuscripts like the Vaticanus and the Sinaiticus and all this stuff, all Greek. Not one Hebrew fragment or anything of the Bible before Christ until, boom, voila, 1947. When they, when the barbarians, you know, trick us into believing that an alien fell in Roswell, crashed, and we got a picture of their little robotic, weird-looking Star Trek, whatever they are. They, they, they've developed this belief in the world now that there's these little grays, right, from, from this fraudulent picture from Roswell, and by the way, 1947. And by the way, that's right after the war because the NAZIs had taken over the world and they were Bavarian uh, Freemasons that had pulled off this hoax back in the 10th and 11th centuries with the Crusades. They were the, 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 the Rosicrucian uh, hoax created by the demons by John D. and Edward Kelly in Bavaria and the Bavarian Illuminati and Adam Weishaupt. And they infiltrated every known truth, government, they went to the British Parliament and took it over, had an affair with Queen Victoria. Many of their children, like Winston Churchill and people like the Clintons and stuff, were in the Bushes, who were lineal descendants also of the Rothschilds and this Vladimir. Yeah, they're always Vladimir, like Vladimir Zelensky and Vladimir Putin. It all goes back to this bloodline of the Vlads, which is going back to this Jewish person that he got from Baghdad 
Charlemagne brought and married his aunt and made this king line, which became popes and very powerful bloodlines that rule over everybody in the world. And they want you to believe that they're legit. So these scribes that were up there in Syria at Petra invented this block letter language. And by the third century, you find manuscripts where they had kind of uh, advanced it and, and, and got it to where they were uh, using it pretty heavily and calling it Hebrew. And what were they doing with it? They were just writing their Talmud and changing all the Bible that was only in Greek into some sort of block letter Hebrew that they invented. So by the Crusade times, when they wanted to prove to the world that they owned that land of Palestine, they brought some of these Pharisee scribes with them and told them, look, here's what we want you to do. We want you to rewrite the Bible, our own version of it, take out the virgin birth, don't let anybody think that Jesus is the Christ. Try to make everybody believe that only our deity in the Torah, that the book of Acts chapter 7 said that we mistakenly and wrongfully and, and wickedly followed because of the stubbornness of our hearts and beginning to worship this, this Rephiam or the demons and sacrificing animals to them. This golden calf, this, this form of religion, this idolatry that we followed. We want you to make the world believe this is the only true religion. And so we're going to add to the Bible and take away. We're going to change the language. And then we're going to get people to believe that this is really the truth. So I don't know if they had this all planned and they took these manuscripts that they made in the 11th century, because it was written on vermilion sheepskin, which is what they were writing at that time. You know, the Piri Resi map and all these ancient maps where they're sailing around the world, these these Vikings or these, uh, what do you call them, uh, skull and bones and the Red Cross ships and, the, you know, uh, that Columbus sailed on with the Red Cross. Yeah, these were Freemasons. And these were these Templars that had taken over the Palestine. They were trying desperately to take this land over and declare themselves to be God. But they're going to do what? They're going to think to change times and laws, the Bible says. And they're going to deceive the entire world and say, I am God and there is none else, when that's not what the truth is. So it's like, well, then how do we believe in the Bible, Dave? Then the Bible's not true. No, the Bible's true. It was written in Greek. The Holy Textus Receptus. So they went down there and they found all these manuscripts and they didn't tell you that there cannot be from before Christ. They were dated from a thousand. These are the actual manuscripts that the Masoretic scribes used. They invented them. So they also found, you've probably heard this copper scroll, like the temple scroll. It was all written in this block Hebrew letter on vermilion sheepskin. But they had this one that was called the copper scroll. Well, it was rolled up. And when they found it, and somehow or another they couldn't unroll it or something, you know, it was like it was so old they couldn't unroll it. So it was that old, right? So they cut it up into this, these little pieces and put it all back together. And they claimed that it says, oh, look, it's written in Hebrew, the oldest form of the Bible. Well, let me tell you something. If you know anything about copper, if it sits around very long, it starts turning green and it will corrode. And if there's any dampness in the air whatsoever, it will eat that copper away till it's completely eaten up and gone within... I don't think a, a copper scroll would last 50 years in any climate, even if it was a dry climate. It would turn green and corrode and just bust and chip away and rot away. Copper doesn't last. I mean, you, you can have a copper pipe on your house that's 50 years old and it'll be eaten through with the with the rust or the green weird chemicalization that whatever it is that 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 corrodes that copper now they say it may you know let's say that it was in a dry climate it still wouldn't have lasted if it was the driest climate you could find it wouldn't last two or three hundred years and they're claiming that this copper scrolls before christ they're lying written in some block letter hebrew script that didn't exist before christ and all the other manuscripts that they're trying to foist on us are also written on this vermilion sheepskin. It's all a big 
freaking lie, a hoax. So what I believe happened is that when Jesus came and condemned them and they saw their temple was destroyed according to the prophecy of Jesus the Lord and the disciples went and began to preach and teach the gospel, they didn't like it. There were these, remember, even in the Bible it tells us there was these Judeans who were zealous for the law. They believed in Jesus, but they were zealous for the law and they were demanding that everybody go back under the law. So they had this dispute and they went to Jerusalem and James said, no, this is our decree, we're not under the law. So there was a lot of fighting going on and arguing. They wanted to go back to the Torah. Maybe they were being they were being backed by some demonic forces that wanted to control the world. And they liked this Torah, which they invented to control law. So they were promulgating it and trying to, to, to deceive the world and to think that our, the Father wasn't El, He wasn't love, but let's worship the other deity. Let's go and take the lower priesthood. So, Though they were already defeated, Jesus had defeated them and, and said, your house is left unto you desolate. But they went up to the area around Petra and they were the ones, they were like a, a school, so to speak, of rabbis that began to use this block letter and copy the Talmud in the Torah. Well, they had this bright idea. They were going to copy the entire Greek Bible and claim it was written in Hebrew originally. And so by doing this, they could say, well, we're the only rightful heirs to this information. It was written in our language and we're the only scribes that know this language. It's a dead language because it didn't exist. We invented it, so we're the only, we're the gatekeepers to this knowledge. You've got to come to us and we'll tell you what it says. It doesn't say Jesus is the king. It doesn't say Jesus is Lord. It doesn't say you are the Elohim like Jesus said. It says only our deity is divine. And he tells you what to do. And you must be slaves and submit. So stick out your head. We're going to cut it off if you don't believe. You're anathema. They wanted complete control. They wanted to subvert the world. So they just made up this whole language so they could distort the words of the true scriptures that came from the true hieroglyph or the holy writings. That today we have in some sort of excerpt form that the disciples used, sort of the Rosetta Stone of all the ancient teachings of every nation called the Bible. It was a collection of books that, that contained all these ancient teachings and the history of the one who was to come, Jesus, who had his disciples and, and freed us from this temple worship and the laws of Moses. Died for our sins and gave us eternal life and freedom. Well, they had to change that. They had to revert it. They wanted to bring the they wanted to bring the beast back up out of the bottomless pit. So they invented the whole thing as a lie. That's why it says he's come down to you having great wrath to deceive the entire inhabited world. By how did he do it in the past? By confusing their language at the gate of El, Bab El, and turning it into Babylon or confusion. And so he did it again with John D. and Edward Kelly, bringing up these demons and they inspired this new language. They had been doing it from the time that they were being controlled by the demons from Petra and Palmyra and all the way down at the Crusades. They began, they, they were making these manuscripts, these forgeries. And probably when they were driven out by the Muslims, they stuck them in, in, uh, vases. Now, if they may have been real manuscripts that they found in 1947. Conveniently? I don't know. Because can you imagine the, at Quamram they had these caves and there was these scrolls in there for thousands of years and nobody ever found them before? Well, all of a sudden some shepherds were walking along and, oh, hey, let's look in the cave. And, oh, there it is. Well, maybe they had been guarding this area for all this time, wouldn't let anybody in there. And then at this particular time, the devil had a plan that they would like stop guarding it and the shepherds would go by and, and be like, oh, look. And they're like, oh, what'd you find? Oh, my. Well, that must be before Christ then. Well, it can't be because it's in block Hebrew script that was after Christ on Vermilion sheepskin. It's impossible. It was from the, the Crusade era. And any scholar who was telling you the truth would tell you that. But they're not telling you that because they're not real scholars. They're liars. As it says in Jeremiah 8.8, 8, the scribes of Yahweh are liars and they have the lying pen of their scribe, as it says. 
So what are they lying about? Well, they're the deceiver, the adversary. And an adversary is the one who takes you to court through some legal system that, you know, you're bound to because you agreed to it, right? As soon as you write your name at the bottom line when you were born on your birth certificate, you agreed to it, right? That was a bond document. It was bonded. You were bonded. What is a bond? Well, a bond slave is a slave. You sign your name, you're a slave. So the 13th Amendment in the Constitution made void the entire Constitution. It didn't set anyone free. It was their plan all along to enslave us all over again. They it shouldn't have had to have a document to set human beings free. The Constitution was, you know, that all men are created equal to start with, right? So what do we need another document that sets people free? That's ridiculous. What they actually did, if you read the 13th Amendment, was they wrote that you can be a permanent slave of the state if you break their law. We're going to make up a law, and if you break it, you get to go to prison. So, yeah, and it, now everybody's a slave, because at that point they made the birth certificate, which is, in other words, something that your mom and dad signs to sign your life away to them. And now they can, at any time, take away your benefits. You don't own the resources. If you want any share in the God-given rights that the Constitution affords you, the pursuit of liberty and happiness, then you've got to do everything they say. If you don't do everything they say, they can convict you in a court of law and either take away your freedoms and forever by putting you in prison or execute you. They have that right. Or just make you a slave. you got to go out there, jobs, 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 and pay the fine, fine, fine. Or you'll go to prison, prison, prison. So that made void the entire Constitution. So this is how they do. This is the, the, the game that they play, that they've been playing since since Christ defeated them. In the first century, they went to Petra and they started inventing this language to make themselves feel important. And then with the Crusades, they tried to fool the world into thinking that they own that land and then they were driven out. But somehow or another, they still got these manuscripts that they can, voila, bring out right at the very day, right, within that month of the time that they went in and declared themselves uh, the rulers of that land with the, the state of Israel. The UN was formed in 1945 for that very purpose. And how did it come about? Because they just, you know, they took the land. The NAZIs, you know, made this big war and they broke or bankrupted Russia. And they bankrupted the United States and Germany and then these NAZIs or these barbarians just took over all the world. Now it really started in 1917 with the Bolshevik Revolution up in Russia and the Bellflower Agreement in Palestine. But they had to take out these individual real true descendants of Israel that were actually controlling the area in the Ottoman Empire, which is why they needed a World War II. And, I mean, there's a lot of reasons they needed a World War II. They needed to con destroy the, the power of the of their enemies, the real people of Europe, which is why there's, they're going to destroy Europe now in the next year. Europe's going to be completely destroyed. You people really need to get out of there right now. You're not going to have any oil, any food. The famine's going to get, oh, my Lord, there's going to be trouble in Europe. And it's coming here. They have this little plan because they want that land. They already destroyed the whole Middle East because they want that land. They control Egypt now and Saudi Arabia and the Emirates, uh, Arabian Emirates or whatever that's called, and and Kuwait and, and Qatar and all these areas. They control it. So they're going to like, voila, we've got the Abrahamic Accords now. You all agree to it, right? Yeah, because you're being ruled over by our like mercenaries called ISIS and Taliban. And, and now they're creating another mercenary group up in Ukraine. And the Russians are working with, it's all one, they're all working together, the KGB, the CIA. So they're going to use the Russian armies backed by Chinese militants and, and, and everything else. And they're going to come down and just wipe out people and shut down the oils and no more cars and people are going to starve. People are going to die. But hey, it's not our fault. It's the darn Russians. When they're done with the Russian armies destroying everybody, 
And by the way, people will be dropping like flies from other thingy thingies, right? By that time, man will be like refined gold. You won't be able to find it anywhere in the world. And the only way you'll make it is if you followed the Lord and got out of there and got out of the cities and went to the mountains and stood faithful and overcame the beast by the word of your testimony and you preached the gospel and loved one another and didn't get involved in all their shenanigans. Because the only person who can save you is Christ because he promised us we're not appointed under the wrath to come and salvation is deliverance or salvation from the wrath that's coming. Those who did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved or delivered from the wrath to come will get the strong delusion. Brothers and sisters, it's coming. It's here. And I'm only telling you this other stuff so that you can understand the whole shenanigan, the whole plot from the time that they started. We've, we've explained this from the time that the demons came down on Mount Hermon and mingled with the children of Dan. And the prophecy of Dan in Genesis 49 is that Dan shall be a serpent's trail. You'll be able to follow the trail by following the serpent's trail. And he left from Sidan, went to London and Denmark and the Donniper and the Danister. And they were the Vikings with the serpent on their sail, the Red Cross or the N-A-Z-I cross. Or wherever they, they, you know, they, they conquer in this name, Constantine said, and they took over the, the mysteries, the truth, the Christians, and instituted what we call Catholicism or modern, the modern apostate religions that teach the God of the Old Testament, not the, the new, and says you gotta go to hell and be punished and pay for your sins and work your way to heaven, and if you don't do everything they say, then you gotta die. Well, that's not the, the gospel of Jesus, my friends. So, well over an hour again here. Um, we probably just should leave it there. But I hope you guys understand that there is no Hebrew Bible. There is no Hebrew language. They have no authority. Everything they're saying is a lie. The truth is that Jesus is Lord. So let's go out and tell everybody the good news. We'll see you tomorrow. And Lord bless you.